Can dieting actually make you fatter in the long run? A 2015 study indicates that this may be the case. Now, after working with hundreds of clients to lose weight in a pro-metabolic fashion, a common trend I have seen is that poorly set up weight loss regimens ultimately lead to fat gain in the long run. And in this video, I want to discuss why I think this happens and what you can do to prevent this. Now, there is research supporting the idea that intentional weight loss can increase the risk of becoming overweight in the future. And we have a quote here from a paper titled, How Dieting Makes the Lean Fatter from a Perspective of Body Composition Autoregulation Through Adipose Stats and Protein Stats, A Weighting Discovery. And the authors say, Strong support for this contention that dieting to lose weight among the lean is a robust predictor of future weight gain can also be derived from the more recent analysis by Patilinin et al. of large population-based cohort of mostly normal weight adolescents with a follow-up from adolescence to young adulthood, which suggests a dose-dependent association between the number of lifetime intentional weight losses, i.e. the frequency of weight cycling, gain in BMI, and risk of overweight. Compared with subjects with no intentional weight loss, a single episode of weight loss increased the risk of becoming overweight by three times in women, and two times in men by age 25. And in addition, women who reported two or more weight loss episodes had five times greater risk of becoming overweight at age 25. So essentially what we're seeing from this quote is that people who attempt to go on weight loss diets, there's an association where in the future, they actually weigh more overall. They have a higher body weight and they have a higher BMI. Now, one of the mechanisms by which this happens is that when you lose weight, if your regimen is set up poorly, you can also tend to lose a large portion of lean body mass. So we'll talk about this in just a few moments as we get towards the end of this video on what you can do to prevent this, but it's absolutely essential that you don't lose large amounts of lean body mass. And I'm going to directly talk about why. Now, when you lose that lean body mass, what happens is when you start to eat again, when you come off the diet, you can actually develop what's called hyperphagia, or you can develop it, which is essentially an excessive appetite that doesn't return to normal until your lean mass is actually regained. And this is something that I personally experience, and I've seen many people experience coming out of low carb fasting, where there's a period of time where you're excessively hungry, you're insatiably hungry. And this also is a period of time where people tend to regain large amounts of weight. And this is especially the case when people are coming from these restrictive backgrounds into a bioenergetic paradigm, they basically go ad libitum, the appetite is high, and they start to put on large amounts of body fat with the high appetite and the shift in a hormonal profile. And so they've actually seen this in previous studies in the Minnesota starvation experiment as an example, and then we'll talk about another study. So what they say here is indeed a striking observation from the Minnesota experiment is that it showed that when their body fat had been completely recovered, so these are the people inside the Minnesota starvation experiment, so i.e. they their body fat had reached 100% of the control values, the fat-free mass, this is their muscle tissue, their organ tissue, etc., was not yet fully recovered, and the hyperphagia, aka the excessive appetite, they say here, the hyperphagia, which was still very much evident, only disappeared when fat-free mass was fully recovered. So essentially, even though body fat mass had been recovered in these individuals in the Minnesota starvation experiment, they didn't lose that excessive appetite until their, their fat free mass was recovered. So they kept eating. And then we'll talk about this as actually leads to, <laughs> to more weight as we go through. So basically what happens is the recovery of fat is actually faster than the recovery of lean tissue. And so what happens is you will start to accrue fat mass rapidly and you'll still have that high appetite because of the hormonal shift, because of the change in metabolic rate, and because of some of the, the changes in dynamics once you, lose, uh, once you lose that weight and you lose that lean mass, it leads to a circumstance where you put on that fat mass much more quickly, and it doesn't stop until you recover that fat-free mass. So we'll talk about this. So the quote here from the same paper says, support for this contention that dieting per se may lead to overshoot in body weight and fat can in fact be derived from classic studies of food deprivation and refeeding in normal weight individuals, showing that more weight and fat are recovered than are lost and in whom hyperphagia persisted well after body weight and fat were fully recovered. So essentially, in other studies, what they've shown is that when people come off of their diets after they've lost the, the, the total body weight, which included body fat and also lean mass, When they got back into a normal diet, they actually regained more fat than before they embarked on this initial fat loss diet. So they wound up with a higher amount of fat mass once everything was all said and done. And this is actually something that you can see in young 
active men in their 20s. So inside the paper, they have a quote here. They say, in more recent years, similar weight and fat overshooting, as well as hyperphagic, which is that excessive appetite, overcompensation, have also been reported in young men recovering from much more modest weight loss than in the Minnesota starvation experiment, namely at the U.S. Army Ranger School, where about 12% of weight loss was observed following eight to nine weeks of training in a multi-stressor environment that includes energy deficit. So what they say here is Nind et al. reported that at five weeks in the post-training recovery phase, body weight had overshot by five kilograms, reflected primarily in large gains in fat mass, and that all the 10 subjects in the study had higher fat mass than before weight loss. So essentially, what we have is we have young men who are in Army Ranger training school. So they're ideally, they're in fit, they're fit, they're in good shape because the Army Ranger training is no joke. And then basically in the training, they put these men under circumstances where they had uh, an energetic de deficit, which caused them to lose body mass. It's part of the training, I guess, to, to in induce stressors so that the men would be able to handle these stressors in combat. That would be my assumption. And then essentially when they got out of training school and then they regained their weight, a lot of the men had overshot their weight and that had been largely in fat mass. So they had actually gained more fat mass when they were done after they had, had lost the initial body weight. They say here again, they say similarly, in another eight weeks of U.S. Army Ranger training course that consisted of four repeated cycles of restricted energy intake and refeeding, Friedel et al. showed that more weight was regained than lost after five weeks of recovery following training cessation with substantial fat overshooting. So four kilograms on average, that's, that's roughly eight to 10 pounds, representing an absolute increase of 40% in body fat compared with pre-training levels. So basically, once these young men finished their training and they start to regain their body weight, they actually regained way more fat mass. It actually, they, the specific amount here was 40% more fat mass, which is obviously not ideal <laughs> if you're going to lose weight. Now, obviously this circumstance is a little bit different because they were inducing these stressors. So which included the energy deficit, but in general, the trend that we see is when you come out of these deficit diets, if they are not set up appropriately, you can actually regain a large amount of fat mass. So what I want to do now is I want to show you what this actually looks like, what is going on um, with a graph here. And we'll talk about why they're regaining so much fat mass in these different circumstances. So basically what we see here, this, this dashed line is the baseline weight. And when we see when in this, this split here, you have the weight loss section. And in the weight loss section, what you see is a loss in fat-free mass and a loss in fat mass, right? So they're losing, you know, maybe 20% 20, 20 of the weight they lose from baseline value is fat-free mass. And then of that 20%, another maybe 60% or so is coming from their fat mass. So, or yeah, from their fat mass. So you have, this is like lean tissue, muscle mass, things like this. And then this is going to be your fat mass. Now, here's the thing. As body weight, as they go out of the weight loss phase into the weight regain phase, you start to see that fat tissue starts to increase again. So they're recovering that. And then fat-free mass starts to increase. Now, here's the kicker. Fat mass's rate of accrual or rate of regain is much more rapid than fat-free mass. So what winds up happening is by the time you, re you regain your fat-free mass, by the time you rebuild that muscle tissue, because of what happens hormonally, and what happens metabolically on some of these dietary setups, you, you are in a circumstance where your fat mass is accruing much more rapidly. So you can see by the time your fat has recovered, your fat free mass has recovered, fat mass would be about here, about a 60% increase from baseline because of the rate of accrual. If the diet is not set up appropriately, this weight loss diet, and you do multiple cycles of this with the yo-yo dieting, what happens is you find yourself in a circumstance where after each cycle, yes, you lost body fat or you lost total weight for a period of time, but each time you lose fat-free mass, which has to get back to baseline. And in order to get it back to baseline, you are increasing fat mass again. And the reason I actually stumbled upon this is because this is something that I've seen with many of my clients. And it's something I've especially seen with female clients, particularly postmenopausal female clients. What winds up happening is after many years of doing this yo-yo dieting, where you're at a weight, you want to lose a little, little bit of weight, maybe it's a summer, or maybe there's a wedding coming up, whatever the deal is, that they embark on kind of a restrictive or potentially extreme weight loss diet, they lose the weight, then they'll re eventually regain the weight. And when they regain the weight, they'll come back a little higher, and then they got to go on the diet again. And then after a number of years of doing this, by the time I'm working with them, the body fat mass is, is higher than we'd want it to be. And lean muscle mass is lower, 
which that's going to be a huge problem. There's a video that you could check out where I talk about this, where essentially the lower your lean mass, the lower your metabolic rate, because basically your lean mass is going to be one of the largest predictors of your resting metabolic rate. So you get to a circumstance where you have a higher fat mass, you have a lower lean mass, and your, your metabolic rate is lower overall. And then on top of that, if you throw menopause into the circumstance, then the hormones fall off a cliff. And it's known that with a change in hormones during menopause, there's a change in the ability to maintain muscle mass that further lead to problems in terms of being able to take that weight, that weight off and regain that lean muscle mass overall makes it harder to hold on to, harder to build. So this leads to a circumstance where it is quite difficult to actually lose weight. So a lot of different stops have to be pulled out to make sure that the body is recompositioned. So we're not just looking for weight loss anymore. It's more about recompositioning the body at this point, which means increasing muscle tissue and lowering fat tissue. Because again, from the hormonal perspective, we're lo- and from an age perspective, we're losing muscle mass over time. So we want to preserve as much muscle mass as possible. The muscle mass is going to predict our resting metabolic rate. And on top of that, the hyperphagic response that we see with weight loss, at least based on some of the information from the study, is largely dictated by the loss in fat-free mass or our lean tissue. So if we don't lose that fat-free mass, if we don't lose that lean tissue, if we build it back up, and then we and we take down the body fat simultaneously, we can find ourselves in a circumstance where maybe we don't get that hyperphagic response and where we don't get that fat overshooting. And this is what I've been playing with and, and utilizing with my own clients. And I found that if you set things up appropriately, you can lose the body fat. Now, it takes a little bit of time to get things under control, but you don't get this rebound after. And it's something that you can sustain long term. So that's absolutely important in this perspective that you sustain it long term. Because again, we want to get out of this, these like binge and bust cycles where you go on these crazy uh, restrictive diets, lose the weight and then regain it all back and more. What are the solutions? What exactly am I doing with my clients? Well, first things first, we have to talk about the frame. When I talk to clients of trying to determine what is the specific goal that they're looking for in terms of their body composition, because a lot of people I work with are looking for a weight loss goal. And a lot of people have an idea in mind of when I was 20 years old, I used to weigh this 130 pounds. So I want to be 130 pounds. And then I've had clients where they get to that target and they're like, well, this isn't exactly what I looked like when I was in my 20s. And it's like, yes, because you have to recomposition. Because when you were 130 pounds in your 20s, you probably had higher muscle mass and lower body fat. So what you want to do is you want to raise that muscle mass and lower your body fat percentage so that you're sitting at that 130 pounds with maybe only 20% body fat or 22% body fat as a woman and not the 30% body fat at the 130 pounds. So recompositioning is the focus. This is extremely important concept. It's not just about weight on the scale anymore. It's about what exactly is going on with your fat mass versus your muscle mass. So I typically shoot at least to start for about a 20% caloric deficit. Now, this is the point where I see people start to lose weight, but it's at the point where it's not so stressful that the person is having issues with their sleep, their mood, their energy, et cetera. And also the diet is going to have to be set up appropriately here. Food selection, macronutrients, et cetera. The next piece we have in terms of macronutrients is protein intake. We want to keep protein intake high. Why? Protein intake is going to help us prevent that loss in lean muscle tissue while you have a deficit set up. And there's another video where I talk about this, so we'll link it below so you can check out that video. But essentially, the protein intake of 0.82 grams per pound per day or one gram per pound of lean body mass per day, depending on your body composition, which I show you how to set this up in more depth in the Nutrition Blueprint video series and PDF guide that you can check out in the link below, basically will help you to maintain your muscle mass when you set up this 20% deficit diet. Now, the next thing you want to do is you want to make sure you have adequate carbohydrates on board to number one, minimize stress, number two, spare your protein so that you don't have to rely on gluconeogenesis, which is the production of glucose from amino acids at your liver. And then the carbohydrate is going to help you to maintain adequate insulin signaling, which has an anabolic effect overall. So the carbohydrates are going to be important for these specific reasons. I like to use around a two to one ratio of carbs to protein. There's going to be some adjustment depending on what your caloric target is, but that is typically around the ratio that I'm shooting for. I go into more detail on this again inside the Nutrition Blueprint video course. It's free and there's also a food guide that goes with it. Following this, I like to make sure that all of the micronutrients are topped off. Why? 
When you run a deficit, a lot of times it can be hard to get all of your specific micronutrients, your vitamins and your minerals, which are absolutely essential for your metabolic function and your ability to, con to convert the fuel that you take in, the carbs and the fats, into ATP, into energy. So you want to make sure those things are backfilled so that the, you don't have a block in your conversion of fuel into energy, which can adjust how, like what's going on with your rate of weight loss. Now, the next thing is we want to remove other blocks outside of micronutrient gaps. And those are going to be things like gut issues, hormonal dysregulation, and circadian dysfunction. All of these components are going to adjust how you're able to shift your body composition, how you manage the deficit in terms of your appetite and things like this. And also making sure that you don't shift into a hormonal profile that causes you to lose lean muscle mass and things like this. So we want to make sure all of those areas are dialed in so we don't have specific blocks in our ability to con convert fuel into energy. Now, from there, something that's really important is you want to set up resistance training. And the reason I set it at this stage and not earlier is because you want to make sure that your metabolism and your body is functioning well before you add a stressor like resistance training. Now, does resistance training have to be a huge stressor? No, you can set up the resistance training in a way that is not that stressful so that you can stimulate the muscle growth without necessarily stimulating high amounts of stress hormones in response to that muscle growth. Because again, the major thing that we're going after here is the muscle growth, which can be dictated by amount of volume and amount of tension applied to the muscle. And we don't necessarily have to make it super stressful and induce super high volumes of muscle damage and things like this. So if you set up the resistance training program appropriately, you can maximize the, the an anabolic response while minimizing some of the stress responses that come with it. And what I typically like to do with clients is I like to set them up at six sets per muscle group per week. There's more that goes into that, but that's a general target that you can look to shoot for with your resistance training program so that you can build some muscle mass, at least protect your muscle mass while you're losing some of the fat mass. And then from there, this is the most important piece of the entire process is you want to set these things up in a system. You want your diet, your supplement regimen, your exercise regimen, et cetera, to be dialed in so that it's something that can be personalized to you. It can be easily implemented by you and you can sustain it over the long term. You want something that you can run on autopilot over the long term so that once you change your body composition, you increase your muscle mass and you lower your fat mass, you're actually able to maintain that going forward and you get out of the cycle of the dreaded fat overshoot with the restrictive diet and then a higher fat overshoot and restricted diet, et cetera. If you're interested in the details of how I set some of the dietary components up, or how I set some of the, the exercise components up. I talk about more of this in a video that you can check out here.